Thank you so much, Justin, you handsome fellow. Oh, so black slide. Right. Ruby motion. Um, she just got real native. So Ruby motion is a tool chain. Um, you probably might have heard of it already. We, uh, it allows you to write full-fledged iOS and OS X applications in Ruby. And um, it has been doing that for, for a while now. Just a short example. This is Hello World in Ruby Motion on iOS. I'm not, I hope you can read it. Basically, you create a label, you create a view controller, and you put it onto the screen. If you're familiar with iOS development, it's, it's the same API. You use the same Cocoa APIs, uh, except you get to use Ruby instead of Objective-C. And uh, it works. It's beautiful. So just quickly about that part. Um, Ruby Motion is not a bridge. If you're familiar, if you're not really familiar with Ruby Motion, the details, and you are familiar with the concept of bridges, uh, Ruby Motion is, uh, is native. It, uh, all the objects that you use are the same objects that you would use if you were using Objective-C. There's no bridging between objects and keeping uh, state uh, synchronous. Ironically, uh, we recently had a conference in San Francisco and it featured the bridge. But so, it's not a bridge. Um, here you can see you have iOS, OS 10, the platforms. Then you have something called the Objective-C runtime. So that's kind of ambiguous that they call it the same. So Objective-C, the runtime, is not Objective-C, the language. Objective-C, the language is underneath in the right and sits on top of the runtime. And Ruby Motion is just another language next to Objective-C to interface to the same runtime. So some of the built-in classes in Ruby Motion uh, that you're familiar with, object, string, array, hash, etc., are, ba are based on NS object, mutable string, mutable array, fixed nums and floats are NS numbers in most cases. Um, they are not in certain cases where we optimize, but we'll get back to that in a little bit. And for instance, something called ba big decimal is basically an NS decimal number. Uh, if an API, a Cocoa API, uh, wants an NS decimal number object, you can just pass it the big decimal. There will be no conversion or whatever. It's just that object. Also, Ruby Motion is not an interpreter like MRI is and other interpreters are. Um, what this means is that uh, an interpreter interprets your source. It, it parses it probably and then interprets the, the abstract syntax tree at runtime. Um, Ruby Motion, this is too small to read. Basically, moo means moo, moo. Uh, it's a thing. Um, so, Ruby Motion uh, interprets some of, some of it at compile time. It creates uh, native code, and that is what gets executed. There's no interpretation at runtime. This means that we do not support things like eval. Um, for that, you need an interpreter, uh, or it would be a JIT compiler in our case, but JIT compilers are not allowed on iOS anyways, so it's not a real big problem. On OS 10, we have a flag that you can optionally include it, but in most cases, the code can be factored that it not, it's not necessary anyways. And the, the runtime is still dynamic, right? So you can still do things with define method, etc. Just not eval a string. So instead of being an interpreter, it's statically compiled. Um, and for this, we use the excellent LLVM, one of the best icons, logos ever, if I may say so myself. The compiler has about 12,000 lines of uh, C++ code, so, but we get to deal with that. It's not up. You don't have to deal with any of that. And as a small example of what that allows us to do is take, for instance, this simple uh, Ruby method that needs no explanation. If you compile that through LLVM, LLVM uses, a, a, let's call it a form of portable assembly. It's their intermediate representation. This is what it would get compiled to. So at the top, you see we define a, a function with a, it gets a C symbol name called RB scope answer. Answer is the, the relevant part. And then the code of what it actually does, and it calls a function called VM fast plus with the, with the arguments and returns the result. The arguments in this case, 85 and 85, are 21 and 21 bit shifted by two. The reason for that is what I referred to earlier with re, uh, regards to the NS number. In some cases, we optimize uh, the objects to use tagged pointers. So all uh, objects uh, are referenced to by pointers, but in some cases, if it can fit in, inside the, the size of a pointer, the number itself, 
um, we use we bit shift it so that the runtime recognizes it as an object and it just immediately reads the the value of the number, which in the case of 21 is easy, small, it fits easily. So then it goes into that function. So it's a C function that we have in our, uh, in our code base. And if, if the operator is not overridden and both of the, uh, the arguments are, are immediate fixed nums, then we just uh, sum them and return that result. But the nice thing there is that LLVM recognizes this, and LLVM comes ships with a whole lot of optimization passes, and one of these is inlining that we enable. So what LLVM recognizes is that, in this case, it can just return the actual result. So it doesn't, it, the, the method after uh, optimizing doesn't do anything else anymore except just immediately returning 42, which is 169 bit shifted by 2. So that's great. There's no more evaluation. It's interpreted, eval evaluated at compile time, and your code is as fast as Objective-C code would get uh, optimized to this. Okay, so that was quickly about the current stuff. Um, Ruby motion today, I can't give exact numbers, but it goes up, basically. It's still going up. It's, uh, we're a bootstrapped company. Uh, we have three full-time uh, and all remote workers, and we have uh, a long-term vision, so this will just keep on going, um, and we're not going anywhere soon. A uh, few applications that use Ruby Motion successfully nowadays, Bandcamp, it's a platform for in the, uh, in the uh, musicians that you probably know. Um, it's, it's a very nice application. It uses all the iOS APIs that you might expect, so it, it does streaming uh, music in the background. And also, it shares Ruby code with their backend, so they have some... Uh, Thread safe hash implementation stuff, uh, if I recall correctly, and they share that code between the backend and the, the Ruby Motion application. There's front back, um, something to make selfies. <laughs> um, it's uh, really popular, um, one million uh, plus uh, downloads on the App Store, and uh, it's one of the biggest de deployment stories of uh, Ruby Motion currently. And then there's a dark room, a game. This has been the number one paid app in the U.S. store for a while. Um, it's, a, it's basically a text-based uh, role-playing game written by Amir Rajan. And it was a web application, I believe. I have never played the web application. And he made a Ruby Motion, uh, an iOS version out of it. And, well, it's been very successful for him. It's recently, recently been featured in The New Yorker. And you should probably check out the game. Yes. So that was all Ruby Motion 2. And now we get to Ruby Motion 3, which we've recently announced. And we want to show you two features. The first one of which is related to the REPL, the read, eval, print loop. Um, as Rubyists, you're all familiar with that and probably love it. Um, it has always, we have always had that in Ruby Motion. Um, nowadays, Apple has something with Swift as well. But we had that for a long time already, and we have some nice features, like you can select views in the simulator and then immediately get that as your context in, uh, in, your, in the REPL and interact with it. Uh, but it has always been just that. You evaluate some code and then for trying out APIs or trying experimenting with your current state. Uh, but we need something better to work on your actual application, because otherwise you have to go back and copy-paste. So. So last week, well, three weeks now. So, oh, too fast, too slow. There we go. So we're going to tune that up a bit. And what it's going to do is uh, your application, once launched, uh, on the left side you see the application as it is launched, currently with a white label to start and below a blue button start. And while your application is running, we keep watching the source. And as you make changes, we uh, statically compile that again and then in inject it into the uh, running runtime. Uh, yeah. While you're actually 
Thank you. So while you work on your application, the code is actually saved and you can just go on your lunch break when you want to go on your lunch break instead of having to remember, did I, did I get everything? So that's one feature. Another, yeah, it's a feature somewhat. A new platform. Can you guess? It's, uh, yeah, BlackBerry. I'm not even sure what the current uh, market share is, and it's not something that we're going to look into very soon, are we? OK. That's not very soon for me. So Android. And for that, I'll uh, hand you over to Laurent, who has been working on that a lot. Thank you. OK, guys, can you hear me? Yep. So yeah, so Android has been, we've been working on a port of Remotion for Android uh, in the last eight months, I think, eight, nine months. So it's brand new, and we just show a, a feature, uh, we just show a preview at our conference a few uh, weeks ago, and I would like to show you a preview again today. So the reason we actually uh, ported Remotion to Android is because a lot of customers have asked for it. And at one point, if you, if you were typing Remotion in Google, uh, the suggestion was actually Android. So it means that a lot of people were actually uh, very interested in it. And uh, I, I actually retrieved these numbers from the internet, so uh, I'm not sure if they are real. But, <coughs> but the, source is, the, the source is a good, good source, I heard. Uh, Android has a much bigger market share than iOS. Uh, and it's actually growing. And the iOS market share is shrinking. Uh, these are for smartphones, but um, obviously, uh, for the tablet market share, originally iOS had a bigger market share last uh, two years ago, but last year uh, Android actually was able to get over it, and the iOS market share is again shrinking a little bit. So we don't make, we don't know yet the numbers for this year, but we expect uh, the trend to continue. So clearly, there is an interest in writing apps for Android now, and so. Thanks to RubyMotion for Android, you can write full-fledged Android apps in Ruby instead of using Java. Uh, so again, uh, this is Hello World in Ruby for Android. You can see it's much smaller than the iOS version. <laughs> no, it doesn't. I mean, it's it's uh, it's not uh, interesting. So what we do here is so Android has the concept of activity, which is some sort of a, something that you show on the screen. And something that that has some features, some I I don't even know. I mean, I'm not a, I'm just learning Android right now at the same time. Um, but yeah, so the, uh, if you want to start an app, you need to subclass the Android activity and create a default activity for your app, and then you can override the onCreate method. You need to call super; it's important, otherwise the application crashes. And then we we just create a text view, and we just set the text to hello world, and then we set the content view of the activity to the text view. And this is the very basic hello world. You cannot get simpler than that. Uh, the Java equivalent is, I think it would be like seven more lines, because you have all the Java uh, class inheritance and the override keyword, and it's like a little bit bigger, but similar. And with the remotion for Android, uh, you can use a simple command line interface to create applications. So you don't have to use Eclipse uh, at all. Eclipse doesn't is not actually part of the of the flow of the development of an Android application, so you never use Eclipse. And obviously, if you've been using RubyMotion for iOS or OS X, it is the exact same experience. To create an app, you just use the command line motion create hello, and you just pass Android as a template. We introduced template a year ago for OS X, and we're already planning on supporting other platforms as well. And so it's going to create a directory named hello, and inside there will be a bunch of files. Uh, the rake file is very important. The rake file contains the project's configuration. So it's not an Eclipse project. So again, you don't use Eclipse at all. It's all Ruby. And the, the application, uh, the Android manifest file, which is like the same as the info playlist uh, file for iOS or OS X, will be derived from uh, the content of the rake file, which is important. So you never have to deal with this XML nonsense. And by default, it's going to create a, a RB file called mainactivity.rb, which is the stuff I was showing you earlier, except that the onCreate method does nothing. So it's up to you to, I don't know, create uh, the next big application and be rich. 
Uh, there are a bunch of directory for resources, and we don't really have time to talk about that, but Android, Android has two separate resources. Uh, you have to learn that, but we support everything. And if you look at the default rake tasks, there are a bunch of them. Obviously, the most common will be, oh, well, I'm going to talk about that right now. But there are a bunch of uh, uh, the, um, tasks that we can use. The default one is just rake. Rake is a shortcut for rake uh, emulator. And if you run it and you are very, very patient, you will get this, like uh, a time knife after. <laughs> it's extremely slow. And the first time, it's even slower because it has to create the, the Android virtual disk. Honestly, it's not a good way to develop applications. So we, we don't recommend to use uh, the emulator for development. If you have an Android device and you just plug it into your computer and you actually enable developer mode in your device, which is very simple to do, uh, you just type break device and you're done. The application, boom, runs on your uh, device right away. This is a Nexus 7 tablet, which is very, a very good uh, Android device, but it works on any, any Android device. And you don't need to get a certificate from, app, uh, from Google or a provisional profile or anything, just type break device. Uh, which is probably the greatest feature of Android. And obviously, the main the main interest of supporting Android now is that if you uh, if you architecture your application uh, well, it is possible to share code between three platforms: iOS, OS X, and Android. So, Remotion will never be a 100% cross-platform solution in the sense that we don't want you to write an app once and then run everywhere, because we don't think it's a good way. We think that an application has to be specifically designed for each platform. And in order to do that, you need to use the platform's API. There are no other ways. So uh, it's not 100% cross-platform, but uh, a lot of the code can be shared. If, if you have an app, an app always has a backend. Always pre Most apps these days connect to a web service or a database. And this code, there is no reason why it cannot be shared across Android or iOS. It's just a connection to a database, right? Uh, the UI has to be written separately for each platform, but you can share code. And we don't know yet exactly how much percentage code you can share right now, uh, because it's just brand new, but we expect at least half of the code of an app, between half and 70% uh, that could be shared. Also, the ecosystem will probably be growing very fast, and a lot of the RubyMotion wrappers or gems right now will be eventually ported to Android. So by default, you can just require a gem, and it should be uh, portable. And I'm going to show you a demo right now. And for the demo, you need to play the demo gods with me, because we are using a very weird setup here. OK. Oops. Recording stop. Try recording again. I'm sorry, Fabian. OK, anyway. Uh, can you see that? So here I have, yes. Oh, so this is a, a Motorola G, Moto G. Uh, I actually bought it a few days ago. And it's connected to my Mac uh, using a USB cable and using a private Wi-Fi in order to uh, 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 cast the, the screen of the device on my Mac. So here I can just use my Mac, and you can see it's working, right? It's a little bit sluggish. It's actually fast, on, uh, it's actually uh, smooth on my machine. So what you see here is just the Android interface, right? So it's working. So now I'm going to show you how to how you do a Ruby Motion app for Android. So bear with me. Uh, okay, you can see that. So let's create a new project. Oops, no. Ah, damn it. Okay, I can go there, and I can type break device. Oh, yes, forget. So right now, you have to specify the SDK and the NDK in the rec file. Uh, when, we, when we will ship, this is going to be set at installation time. So right now, we need to do that. This is just a pass where uh, the Android SDK and the NDK are on my machine. So now I can type rec device. Install the application. And here, I have my hello application right here. And there is nothing in there, right? Because it's there is nothing in my in my source code. So now I can just 
with the application. And let's check the, the main activity file. So as I said, uh, the file is empty by default, so it's up to you to type stuff. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to do that right now. I'm going to create a Android widget, text view, that new self. So every time you create a view, you need to provide a reference to the main activity. I don't really know why, but this is the way the Android people uh, designed the API. Uh, hello. Uh, OK. Uh, self content view equal equal text. It's important to know that the, the real API is set content view, and here the real API is set text. But in Ruby, you can use shortcuts. In Ruby Motion, you can use text equal instead of coding set text. We have similar shortcut for iOS or OS 10. And I can just quit. Type break device. I need to start the. And boom, it works there. <laughs> By default, the font is very small, but it's there. Uh, I, would, I would like just to show you uh, how, how fast an application for, uh, for Android in Rebotion uh, starts. So if I kill the application here and I start it again, boom, it's there. I'm going to do it again. And boom. So it starts as fast as uh, a Java written application. It's actually very important. There's no interpretation going, starting a runtime, whatever. It's yeah. just and uh, the remotion uh, runtime just loads right away. There is no, we don't need to evaluate or JIT compile anything. Uh, no, uh, we don't really have a lot of time, so I'm just going to show you another example, and very soon you will be able to uh, see more stuff on the internet. Uh, if I go on. I'm going to show you the, let's say, oh, we have, a, we have this one. This one is nice. It's a paint application. You can just draw lines on the screen. Oop. You can be an artist. And here there is a clear button. And the source code is very simple. I'm going to show you right here. So we subclass uh, the Android view view class. In there, we, yeah, that's weird. That's a package, but uh, here we overwrite two methods, on draw and on touch event. On touch event is going to be called when the user touches something on the screen. And here we actually record uh, the gesture. And on the on draw uh, method, we actually draw the stuff we actually kept in memory. So very simple. I'm just going to show you uh, just one last uh, sample, the timer. And the timer is actually a port of uh, an application we have for iOS. So it's actually a very simple app. And the font is big because I wrote the sample for my Nexus 7 tablet, which is big. So yeah, for Android, you really need to think about uh, all, the, all the screens you, you can support. But you can start the timer, stop, start again, stop. And I'm just going to show you very quickly the source code, and then I will go back on the slides. Uh, here, on the main activity, we create our layout, and here we use the layout, linear layout, in order to pack two views uh, vertically. And the first one is the label, which is going to be changed later on. The initial text is tapped up to start, and later on we will actually increment the number there. And the button is there, and here we provide the on-click listener property of the button is going to be this object. This is the sense of time timer button listener class. And if we go there, it's actually defined here. And here we define only one method on click, which is, um, which, which is going to override the pure Java method. And we call the toggle timer method. Toggle timer is defined right here. And here, if the, if the timer is already active, we cancel it. Otherwise, we run it. And when, when we create a timer, we actually schedule a task object. A task object is going to be an instance of this class, timer task, which is also defined right here. And here we override the run method, the pure Java uh, method. And there, which is, this is, this is the fun part, we actually schedule um, a block that's going to be run on the main thread of the application. 
The reason is that if you try to change the, the label here, it's going to crash because the timer runs on a separate thread and you're not supposed to UI work on, the, uh, on another thread than the main one in Android. So here we use the handler, up, the handler class defined here. And the handler class is some sort of an object that lets you send messages from one thread to the other. And the interesting thing, very interesting here, is the post method. The post method accepts an object that runs, that implements the runnable interface, the Java lang runnable interface. So in Java here, you would actually be uh, creating an anonymous class with a default run method that runs your code. And here in RubyMotion, we can just pass a proc because procs in RubyMotion for Android uh, implement runnable. So this is much, uh, this is much re nicer to read, right? I think. <laughs> Anyway, this is just Remotion for Android, and it works very well. We have an app on the Play Store, and we're going to ship the beta uh, next week. But let's go back to the slides. Okay, that was the demo. So, how does it work? Uh, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how it's actually implemented. And the first thing is the runtime. The runtime is Ruby. It's actually a brand new implementation of Ruby. Uh, it's totally new, it's a new code base, and it's actually very frightening uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, because I didn't want to rewrite Ruby again, <laughs> but we've been working on this new project and it's a new implementation again. So we use Ruby spec uh, in order to make sure that we really implement Ruby. Uh, we did the same thing for Mac Ruby. So it's going to be a new, brand new implementation of Ruby. The difference is that it has a unified object model with Java. So it's, uh, this is something very new. And as far as I know, nobody has done this yet. Uh, so to, to actually use a similar um, graph that uh, Elo showed uh, earlier, uh, Ruby Motion and Android sit on top of the Dolvik virtual machine on Android. And through this virtual machine, you can actually call the Android APIs. It's all Java. But the thing is that, uh, the Dalvik Utility Machine exposes uh, what they call GNI, which is like a C-based interface that lets you interact with the virtual machine. So you can actually uh, interface with Java objects, create Java classes, and so on, and create Java methods. And so we actually use this interface to re-implement Ruby. So it's actually a whole implementation of Ruby based on GNI, which is on Dalvik. And you, you might have heard of a new runtime for Android called Art, and it's actually very similar. It's actually very close. So uh, in Ruby Motion for Android, the object model is unified. So Ruby classes are Java classes. Ruby methods are Java methods. Ruby objects are Java objects. And Ruby exceptions are Java exceptions, and vice versa. So when you write uh, an app for Ruby Motion for Android and you use a Java class, it feels like a Ruby class because it's the same runtime, and vice versa. So no bridging again. Same uh, thing we did for uh, iOS and OS X. And also, similar to what we did for iOS and OS 10, we actually rebase some of the built-in classes of Ruby on top of Java classes so that they won't be converted. Uh, string is actually a subclass that implements Java lar car sequence, which is interface. And a lot of APIs in Android, actually most of them, that expect a string representation, though they don't accept a Java lang uh, string, they accept an, an object that implements car sequence. So for example, the set text method on the text view class I showed earlier, it expects a car sequence, so it works, no conversion. Array is actually a Java util array list. Hash is actually a Java util hash map. Uh, the numeric types are based on the language uh, numeric types. Uh, it turns out that uh, Java has a big integer class. I didn't know that, uh, so we actually use it for bignum. Re a regular expression is a regex, and it uses ICU as well, so there won't be any compatibility uh, uh, differences between uh, the code you write for RubyMotion, iOS, and for Android. And finally, threads are Java lang threads. And so it's actually interesting to mention that the runtime for RubyMotion for Android is purely a reentrant. So there is no lock that prevents you from running uh, two threads at the same time. The memory management is delegated to Dalvik. And this one is a little bit different. Uh, for iOS, we rely uh, on auto-release pools and, and the retain-based system of Objective-C. Android is much more advanced. Uh, it has a real GC, which is awesome. Uh, it's too bad Apple doesn't want to do a uh, real GC. And this one is generational. It's concurrent. 
So sometimes the, the objects will be finalized on other threads and the thread they've been created from. And uh, each thread has a, a, an allocation pool so that allocations are very fast. Uh, so I'm going to be quick right now. Uh, there are two types of references that uh, an object uh, code can create. They are local references that are created by default in your app, and they are global references that determine a runtime. When you create when you create objects as local variables, there's going to be local refs, and when you assign an object to something in memory, it's going to be a global ref. So let's have a look. We have a foo method here with a bunch of lines. So we start here. X equal object dot new is going to create a local reference. Blue is for local ref. Then we go there, we y equal object new is going to create another local reference. Here, we actually create an instance variable, so it's going to be a global reference. Right. And at the very end of this line, our object y disappear. Uh, why exactly? It's because if you look at the source code, y is not used anymore in the method. So the compiler knows that at this point, y is not needed anymore. So it's going to insert a call that will destroy the local reference. Then we call bar bar twice, then we print the value of x, and then after that, x, x is destroyed, because af after the px expression, x is not used anymore. So the compiler is going to remove the local reference, and that's how it works. So loca the local references are, destruction is determined at compilation time, and we also have cleanup anyway, so if, you leave, if we actually forget to clean up some local references, there will be cleanup after each uh, dispatch call. But the global stuff remains. And we have uh, the compiler is, so Ruby Motion for Android apps are compiled into machine code exactly like uh, iOS and OS 10 apps. We also use the awesome LVM project for that. It's a static compilation machine for uh, GNI. GNI is this interface I talk about, C-based interface. And let's have an example. We have a main activity here on create method. It's going to generate two functions in the IR. One, the first one contains the actual source code of, of your project. The, the, the RB files will be compiled into machine code here, so we won't translate it to Java bytecode. It's really pure machine code. And the second one will be the stub, and I'm not sure if I can point, but if you can see here, we call the onCreate method defined earlier, and this one will be inserted into the, the Java virtual machine. Uh, the compiler has to generate DEX bytecode for class interfaces. The reason is that the, the implementation of GNI by Google is not really 100% complete, and it doesn't allow the creation of classes at runtime. So we have to create uh, the DEX bytecode to bootstrap them. And it's actually very important to know that the source code of the methods will not be into the bytecode, just the, the actual class interface. So let's have a quick example. We have two methods here, onCreate and dispatch.event. And the compiler is going to generate this uh, DEX bytecode. So on the first three lines, you see the definition of the class with the superclass. And then we have two virtual methods, uh, dispatch to event and on create. And as you can see the, on the access line, they are defined as native. So it means that the source code of these methods is not there. It's actually elsewhere. It will be in the machine code that we generate later on. And uh, we don't have time for this part, so I'm going to skip it. We actually generate dwarf metadata, which is a debugging information that lets you, uh, at runtime, set breakpoints or uh, simply get backtraces based on the um, based on, on just, just a binary, a row binary. You can actually determine there is a nice thing. So we generate this file, and we can simply get exceptions here, which is very, very, very important. The nice thing in that regard is that it's full stack, right? So it's mm -hmm. because it's all native, it's in between. The, if you have something in the Java stack going down through your code, it's all in the same stack, and you can refer, traverse through that. Yep. And you can connect a debugger or a profiler, and you will get a real Ruby. Uh, Information like file and line. Okay. There we go. This is the end. Thank you for staying. <laughs>